We hear a lot of perspectives on the Mankind Podcast. Inclusion of a guest is not an endorsement of their views, and the opinions expressed here do not always represent the mission or values of the Mankind Project USA. Looks like the rain has gone. Today and welcome to the Mankind Podcast, the show where we break the molds of modern manhood to prove that there's more than just one way to be a man. I'm your host, Brandon Clifton. Today's episode with Terry Reel is all about intimacy. Now, you're going to really enjoy this episode if you've found yourself either in your current relationship or in previous relationships wondering where the line is drawn between how do I fill my cup? How do I fill the cup of my partners? What does intimacy look like? Are we paddling down the same river? Are we paddling in the same boat? Are we in separate boats? All of these questions that may be alive in you, whether it's in your current relationship or previous ones, may be answered as we spend time with the legend himself, Terry Real. Enjoy. G'day and welcome to another live recording of the Mankind Podcast, the show where we break the molds of modern manhood to prove there is more than just one way to be a man. I'm your host, Brandon Clift, and today we are joined by, uh, and Terry, I hope you're fine with me saying this, a legend in the, uh, <laughs> in the men's work and relationship space, Terry Real. Now, uh, Terry founded the Relational Life Institute, RLI, offering workshops for couples, individuals, and parents around the country, along with a professional training program for clinicians wanting to learn is relational light therapy methodology. Now, mate, there is a million things that I would love to spend time with you talking about, but we don't have the time to dive into all of it. So today we're going to be diving into a very important topic, which is intimacy and the importance of it and how it gets confused, right? So for those that are, aren't privy to your work just yet, mate, take a moment to t- give us a little insight into your career and your work so far, and we'll dive in. Oh my gosh. Okay. Who am I? Um, uh, I am a psychotherapist, a family therapist, couples therapist, been teaching all that for well over 30 years and practicing, uh, back in the nineties, I wrote a book called, I don't want to talk about it. Um, people are still reading it. Keep going. Uh, it was the first book ever written about male depression. Before that book, depression was seen as a woman's disease, and uh, I'm proud of my role in outing uh, that condition. But more than that, it was a book about what our culture does to boys and how it shows up in men as uh, many of the difficulties that we think of as typically male violence, uh, difficulty with relationships, uh, drinking, drugging. and um, what I talk about in the book is what I call normal boyhood traumatization. Uh, the way in which patriarchy, which is a system we all live in, it, even today, it's not changed, uh, stamps onto boys a code. And the process of imposing that on a boy is intrinsically traumatizing. It's violent. It's emotionally violent and sometimes physically violent. And then what that violence does to us as grown men. Uh, The book was a big hit. There are an estimated 6 million uh, depressed men in America at any point. So I like to say the book showed up in pillows all over America. Here, it was bought by the women, right? Here, honey. Naturally, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You want to get close to me, read this book. Anyway, I started getting calls from around the country. Is there somebody in Topeka or Illinois or wherever? that does the work you describe in the book, because the book's very full of stories. And for a while I said no, and did, did my best. But after a while I said, look, if, you're, if you have the resources and you're desperate enough, come to Boston and see me. And what evolved was a two day, I call it relationship intervention. It's still the bulk of my clinical work. A couple comes to see me from wherever, We spend two days together. At the end of the two days, we decide together that you're on track or getting a divorce. This is the last stop. 
And I noticed two things. The first is that I had a pretty good batting average, most by far. Most people were talked off the ledge. And two is I broke every rule I'd ever learned in therapy school about how to be a therapist. And I was already teaching therapy and writing about it. So rather than doubt myself, I doubted the practice and I evolved a very different way of doing therapy with men and with couples. Uh, we take sides. We're not neutral. We share from our own uh, lives. We deal with issues of one down inferiority, but also one up superiority. Uh, we're active mentors. We're not blank screen. So in the job of teaching good people how to be relational, the whole role of the therapy has shifted in my work. We're more like 12-step sponsors than traditional therapists. We're, 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 we're in the mud pit right with you. I've, I really appreciate that about you, Terry. I mean, you're one of the first people to, to normalize the conversation for men yes, thank you. And, and depression. So that, that has left an, uh, you know, such a ripple effect across the world. And, and we've seen that change inside the Mankind Project as well. And, but not only that, mate, you've got, you've got 40 plus years yeah. of experience working with men and, 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 and couples as well. And what I want to ask you is, especially as it relates to intimacy, mm, let me shelve that question. Let's talk about intimacy first. And then I All want right. to ask this question. Uh, you yes. have a new book coming out. It's not going to be uh, out until next and, year, uh, you've next just March. Planning the seed for the listeners. Uh, Get excited. And, and, and <laughs> we'll be back next spring away. to talk about it, no doubt. But Okay. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> uh, but tell us about intimacy. Can you just give me like the, the, the broadest example of intimacy before we get into the depths of it? You know, uh, I had the privilege of uh, working with a rock star and I love listening to him talk about his art. And uh, one day I was talking to him about intimacy and he said, you know, it's just like you're up on the stage singing song. You know what rock and roll boils down to? I said, okay, tell me. He says, hey, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> That's intimacy. Transmission received. I say something that goes into you. It kicks around in there. It means something to you. It doesn't just bounce off. And then you say something back, which goes into me. And uh, it's a conversation. And it, it, intimacy can get jammed up in either transmission or reception. So uh, if you go to my website, I have an intimacy quiz you can take. And uh, I basically just look at five human dimensions, intellect, emotion, physicality, spirituality, and sexuality. And in your current relationship now, do you feel like you transmit? Uh, do you feel powerful sexually? Do you, can you express yourself? Do you feel like it's received? Do you feel like your partner can transmit? And do you feel like you can receive? So intellectual, physical, can you touch each other? But sexual, can you be sexual with each other? Uh, spiritual, do you have the same goals? Do you have a purpose larger than the two of you? And emotional, which is at one through 20. Emotional intimacy is the name of the game. And of course, a lot of men uh, filter their emotional needs through sexuality. Uh, being sexual is the only place to let down and be close. But that's not the way we're built. We're built for the whole thing. You know, I said earlier that traditional masculinity knocks boys out of health. And uh, what you have to understand, and I'm writing about this in the new book, there are two pillars, the patriarchy and individualism, which are the core of our culture. Uh, one is invulnerability. The more manly you are, the more invulnerable you are, the more vulnerable you are, the more unmanly you are in the traditional setup. Masculinity equals invulnerability. 
vulnerability equals weakness. And the second pillar is dominance. God gave Adam dominion over all that walked and crawled and swam on this earth. Really bad idea. Maybe it's a bad translation. But we don't have dominion over nature. We're not on top of nature like God controlling it. We are in nature, whether the nature that we're trying to control is our partners or our kids or our boss or our bodies or our thinking, don't be so negative, or, 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 or. Controlling nature is a delusion and potentially a lethal one. So moving men into intimacy means opening up their hearts to allow for vulnerability and even sharing vulnerability, allowing for vulnerability in others and being compassionate to it, and uh, realizing that uh, you are not in charge of this universe. Uh, you're a humble component part. You know, when we think about relationships, uh, I like to say uh, our relationships are like our biosphere. We're not above it. We're in it. It's the air we breathe. And you can pollute your relationship over here by uh, having a temper tantrum, but you'll breathe in that pollution over here by your partner's distance and withdrawal. You're connected. You can't escape the results. You know, the, the plastic we're pumping into the ocean is the water that we drink. Uh, we're not disconnected from it. We're in it. And when you move from above it and in control of it to in it and having humility, you break the back of traditional masculinity and you open men up to real intimacy. Most would like to hear that. Well, I mean, that's, it's got to be said that that can be scary for a lot of men that have been operating in this, this model that you've mentioned, right? Those two pillars. Yeah. It's, it's a scary process to let go of that control. Yeah. Of course, you never had that control to begin with. You, it's it's an like an illusion. <laughs> it's like an ostrich sticking his head in the sand, thinking it's safe. It's like, I've got, I've got control of this. No, you don't. Is, is, what do you think drives that fear for men that, that causes them to uh, continue to abide by this illusion of being in control and, and sticking to the traditional male role, let's just say, when it comes to relationships? I tell a story, and I don't want to talk about it, uh, of my two sons who are now 30 and 32, 33. But um, when they were little, when they were six and three, uh, my older son's always been a jock, and my younger son's always been a spirit. And uh, when my uh, three-year-old uh, loved to imagine and dress up, he dressed up as all sorts of things. He was a bear, he was cowboys and Indian. Uh, but it, it, his favorite uh, dress up was a Barbie, uh, Barbie the Good Witch. And he had like this diaphanous shift and he had a tiara and he had a wand and he'd go around and he'd bless things and transform things and cast spells and do all this stuff. By the way, I love to tell this story. Uh, a, a famous friend of ours who worked on gender issues took it upon herself to call my wife and uh, express her concern about Alexander's dress. He's three, mind you. But, uh, but she was concerned that he might have gender confusion. And you don't mess with my wife. Uh, without missing a beat, she said, oh, my God, I never thought of that. You know, he dresses up like a bear, too. Do you think he has species confusion? <laughs> it was a line for me, so I can relate. <laughs> But, you know, wear a dress, and it's a big deal. So it, his older brother, Justin, was downstairs with a bunch of six-year-olds. He's three. And he puts on his dress. Oh, my God, all these kids. And he runs down. He's like, ta-da. 
And these boys, now these are ultra liberal, you know, Boston mass, blue, blue boys. They don't say one mean thing. They just look at him and stare. Not one word. And I want to tell you, that was red hot that moment. I turned red. He turned red. He ran upstairs. Absolutely true story. Ran upstairs, took off his dress, the hair on, put himself in the jeans, went downstairs and made some swords and guns with the boys in my workshop. Never touched that dress again. Never. Now, I, I say this to therapists when I speak around the country. Would that we had as therapists a force so powerful that without a word, in 60 seconds, we could turn somebody's favorite activity to something they never touched for the rest of, the, of their lives. What a powerful force for good that would be. But it wasn't for good. It was for the imposition of the rules. And how the rules got imposed was shame. That red, hot energy was shame. Who do you think you are? And the way that masculinity is enforced on our playgrounds and in people's houses is through uh, shame and violence. I had a guy whose presenting problem was that he masturbated. He was a sex addict and he was an offender. He was a predator. He used to masturbate in public on purpose. And I took him back to his roots. And he remembered being five. And his stepfather that lined up the entire family, like eight of them, ceremoniously, and had this five-year-old burn his blanket, his security blanket, uh, because uh, it, it, that was for babies. Five. You know, after 50 years of feminism, uh, when a girl steps out of the girly role, uh, it, 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 she can get some shit for it, but it, it's reasonably okay in most places. When a boy steps out of the masculine role, the results are violent, immediate, and powerful. Every boy knows that it's dangerous to step out of that role. Three, four, five. That shame that you talk about, I've, I've heard you talk about it previously in certain pre presentations where shame, you know, it's like we would never consciously, you know, if we consider ourselves to be good people, right, we'd never consciously in our right mind seek to harm people on a daily basis, especially those that are closest to us. Yet shame in a way acts as a way to continually harm ourselves. Yes, we internalize it, don't we? Mm. Yeah. It's very hard for a man in our culture to have healthy self-esteem because our culture doesn't have it. Mm. Healthy self-esteem, which is what I teach people, and is the core of the work that we do, and I'm sure it is for you too, Healthy self-esteem comes from the inside out. I have worth and I matter and my essential worth is no better or less than the guy to the left or the right of me. It can't be. It's, it's a God-given fact. I have dignity because I'm a human being on this planet. And my new book is about what I call the great lie of individualism. And the great lie is the delusion that one person could be superior or inferior to another person. Our whole culture runs on that lie. But uh, we know better. It, 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 philosophically, we know better. It's, it's the essence of democracy. It's the essence of medical ethics. It's the essence of the law. No man greater or lesser in the eyes of the law. But we don't live like that. And we don't treat ourselves like that. And instead of healthy self-esteem, which comes from the inside out, uh, our country runs on the three forms of unhealthy self-esteem. I got this from my mentor, Pia Melody, years ago. Uh, Other-based esteem, 
I don't feel good about myself, but you feel good about me, so I feel good. That's a big one for women. But it's also big for men in terms of their careers. Uh, I feel loved by my cohort, my group. Uh, I was given this award. I was promoted. That's love. The second is attribute-based esteem. I have worth because of what I have. Uh, you know, buy this car and be a man of distinction. That is behind my name. Letters behind my name. Yeah, here in Boston, Mass., it's a kid in Harvard. Uh, that's attribute based esteem. And then the other is performance based esteem. I have worth because of what I can do. And this is essential for many men. Mm. I, I hit the grand slam. I have worth. I, I made a killing in the market. I closed that deal. I gave my wife an orgasm. Uh, and the problem, there are many problems with basing your sense of worth on performance. The first is it's completely fraught. It is endlessly, you're only as good as your last game. You have to keep proving it over and over and over again. And secondly, there's always somebody wanting to eat your lunch, warming up in the bullpen. Mm. And finally, it's a lie. Invulnerability is a lie. You, you, we're not invulnerable. We're very vulnerable creatures as human beings. I, I say to guys, trying to run from your vulnerability is like trying to escape your own rectum. <laughs> it has a way of following you wherever you go. Same with shadow. All well, right. <laughs> you can't run away from that shadow. And it, it's always going to be there as a, as a reminder. And that's what I love about one of the big takeaways from working in men's work has been identifying you know, what you coined as the rectum, I call in the shadow <laughs> is <laughs> that, that, you know, that shadow part of me, the part of me that I've hidden, repressed, denied because of various exp experiences. It's always going to be there. However, same with vulnerability. If I can choose to look at it and become aware of it, I may never be able to get rid of it, but I can at least take some of the power out of it, right? Take its hands off the steering wheel. Now, Terry, we've been talking a lot about the individual, which, you know, a lot of people think intimacy is about relationships with others, but really it starts with the individual, correct? Yes. So let's start, let's dive into like individual intimacy because we've heard the cliche, right? You can't love someone else unless you can love yourself, right? Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of truth to that and validity to that, don't you think? Yeah, there is. Um, here's how I put that. Healthy self-esteem is same as, neither better than nor worse than. I'm here. I'm breathing. What do you want? You're next to me. Let's, let's horse trade. Unhealthy self-esteem can look like uh, one condition that the whole culture has been obsessed with for 50 years, shame. Mm. Inferiority, feeling less than, which, of course, a lot of men feel. The other self-esteem disorder, which therapy has not dealt with hardly at all, is superiority, grandiosity, being better than. And what you find for a lot of men uh, is that while they may be feeling inferior inside, if you run the cameras, uh, they're acting like uh, angry, dominating uh, entitled, grandiose assholes. Mm. And one of the things I teach therapists uh, around the country is you, you cannot help men if you can't help them move up from the one down of shame and also down from the one up of grandiosity. It has to be both. You, you cannot love from an inferior position and you cannot love from a superior position. Healthy self-esteem and love for another are synonyms because you're neither better nor worse. Uh, my summation phrase, Brandon, is love demands democracy. Even something as individualistic as self-esteem turns out to be social. So healthy self-esteem means I don't place myself above or below mm. you. I feel good about me, uh, independent of proving 
my superiority to you. Yeah. But it's also, it also speaks to, if we talk democracy, it also speaks to the fragility of democracy, right? It's, yes. a, it's, a, it's a fragile model. Yes, it is. And I talk about including the voice, bringing to the table the voices that are unheard. And at a social level, I'm talking about race, I'm talking about class, I'm talking about sexual orientation. At the individual psychological level, I'm talking about all of those shadows inside of you. All of those parts of you that you have exiled, orphaned, abandoned. This takes me to so many experiences. Um, I've done a couple new warrior trainings, which for those just coming into the the podcast now, um, is the the flagship training, right, for the Mankind Project. It's the the rite of passage, many have said, although there are multiple rites of passage, as you could say, within the organization. Um, But I see a lot of men on a weekend claim something that they haven't touched in a long time or Mm. reclaim something that they lost, Mm. like if their blanket was burnt when they were five. Mm. and then it's like you're on the weekend we've all had that seminar experience where it's like hoorah jump in the air let's go we're empowered and then come tuesday by the time they've gone home to their families it's like cool take out the trash (laughs) well you know it's a funny thing um if you go to youtube if you if you type in my name on youtube i gave a talk for robert Bly and the men's minnesota conference years back and this is what I said. I said, it's all, it's fantastic for us to meet together as a group and support each other and be out here in the woods and open up our hearts. But uh, come Monday morning, we have to bring it to our families. We can't just leave it here in the woods. And that was the essence of my message to the guys. It's the integration, right? It's like, we've given you some tools. Now use them. Uh- You've said, though, in, in some of your, um, your talks, and I love that you say this, is that, you know, a lot of workshops give people tools. <laughs> and, 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 but what you do is you, <laughs> you speak to the level where people aren't willing to use the tools. They might have all the theoretical understandings of if I'm being a little boy right now, if I'm throwing, you know, if I'm a high chair tyrant as a 28 year old male, am I doing the, there are those moments where I'm being a high chair tyrant. <laughs> I've essentially gone back to five years old. And that's what I love about the Mankind Project, right? We try and hit impact that level where it's like, even in the unconscious, mm-hmm. there is something that has been integrated into life mm-hmm. that we can make different decisions, right? Different choices. That, that, that is the beauty right there. Um, I have a friend and colleague, Thomas Ubel. He's a German mystic who lives in Israel now. And uh, he has a million phrases. And one of them I love, to observe is to have choice. Mm. To observe is to have choice. And uh, the, the new book starts with a chapter called The Two Yous. And uh, when you are in the the brand that i'm talking to right now how old are you 28 28 year old brand is in the here and now in the present uh if uh, we were intimate friends and i hurt your feelings or if we were partners and you know you came home and the house was a mess or whatever and you got triggered the adult i call it wise adult part of you prefrontal cortex the most developed part of the brain shuts down and the limbic system, Mm -hmm. the emotional part of the brain uh, fires up. I call that the adaptive child part of you uh, and wounded child parts of you. They're less mature parts of you and you're trauma triggered. And what trauma trigger means is not that you're remembering it. You're not 28 year old Brandon remembering when you were five talking to, I'm going to make it up your critical father. Uh, You are that five year old and your partner is that critical father. And you're as helpless and you're flooded with all the feelings of that five year old and left to your own resources. You're going to act like that five year old. You're going to do what he did. You're going to fight or withdraw or do whatever you learned to do back then. The art of what I call relational recovery, of reclaiming our maturity, is not getting rid of that five-year-old. 
But it's not tightly controlling it or being harsh with it. You don't meet harshness with harshness. Mm. You meet harshness with firm love. But what it is, is bringing this adult part of you into relationship with that overwhelmed five-year-old. Putting your arms around him, listening to him, being compassionate to him, and as you said, take his sticky hands off the steering wheel. Mm. When my wife, Linda, are having a fight, and she comes at me with anger, we're both fighters, she comes at me with anger, I take little Terry, I've got a, about an eight-year-old composite, and I put him behind me. I teach this to the men I work with. And I say, I make a deal with them. I say to them, look, you stay back there, I will protect you from whatever Belinda's throwing at me. Mm. Between her and you is me, my big body, my strong back. Nothing's going to get through to you. But your part of the deal, little Terry, is you let me deal with Belinda. Don't you try and deal with her. Yeah. That's and that's the work. First, we must befriend our own vulnerabilities. And we must deal with the ways we learn to adapt, often not very functional ways of adapting. It's, you know, it's, it's funny how that sometimes that uh, self-esteem gets a bit low for me because I've been in work for, in men's work for five years now. And, oh my gosh, oh, that's a lifetime, right? That's a lifetime of work, five years. But, it, you know, there's been a big journey. And, and when, when I haven't geared myself or, or prepared myself to have that conversation with little Brandon, sometimes I find myself just kicking myself going, oh, mate, you, you know better than this after the fact so for those of us who may not have the insights in the moment to go okay little brandon <laughs> let's go back here um what do you say to that what do you say to those men that 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 is it just a, a matter of practice uh, listen listen I, I, i'll tell you one thing and, and if your listeners just get this one thing and nothing more from this conversation it will be well spent and I teach this to every man and woman I encounter. There is no redeeming value in harshness. Just take that in. There is nothing that harshness does that loving firmness doesn't do better. If it's harsh, it's off. So, uh, at my ripe old age, 35 years married, I have a deal with the universe, and I live this. Now, here's my deal. If it's unkind, I'm not interested. Find a way to say it to me kindly, and I'm interested. And that very much goes for me talking to me, as well as you talking to me. A lot of the men I work with, I say to them, if somebody outside of you talked to you like this, you'd punch them. But because it's you ripping the shreds out of you, you think it's okay. Yeah. Lean into that part and tell it to pipe down. But can I tell you a story? I, I, I love your stories. Anecdotes, like to, throw them at me. <laughs> I like to tell stories. So I was on a plane. Uh, I just given a big talk to uh, you know a few hundred therapists, and I was signing uh, books. And one of the people responds was, Terry, Terry, you're going to be late for your plane. Oh, my God. Okay. I get on the plane. I kick my shoes off. It was a great day. I'm feeling great. And then I feel this cold wetness on my shirt. You know the story already? I don't know if you know it. Uh, I, <laughs> Lips and, are sealed. Keep going. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. And I looked down, and I had been signing the books with a Sharpie. And I put it in my breast pocket of my shirt without a cover. And my whole shirt was full of black, permanent ink and ruin. And it was an expensive shirt, too. Now, I'm a, I've struggled with depression. You know, that's why I wrote the book. I've got ADD. I'm always bumping things, losing things, breaking things, and giving myself a hard time. So I started giving myself a hard time. You can't believe it. You can never, you're always doing this. You can't, I can't trust you. For, uh, and in a former day, th that hard time could have parlayed into a five day depression. 
Well, all depression is, is beating yourself up endlessly. So on this day, after 30 plus years of recovery, I leaned into that immature boy in me, just a little boy. And I said, hey, look, the same brain that ruined the shirt is the brain that wrote the books that were being autographed. So why don't you cut me some slack? And he did. And what would have been a five-day bloodbath was over in 10 minutes. Wow. You have to learn to stand up to these little Terry's and little Brandon's uh, and parent them, love them, listen to them, be compassionate to them, and demote them. They're not in charge. You are. Part of the story you left out, mate, is that it was your Oprah shirt. <laughs> it was. It was. I hope I go on. I did get on Oprah. It didn't go very well. <laughs> but maybe if I'd worn that shirt, it would have gone better. Ah, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? But, you know, a beautiful story came out of that. And, and that to have the grace for self in those moments, can, gosh, it can be tough. There are moments where I can be in a uh, disagreement with my partner and I see the, sh I see the kill shot. I see the kill shot. And, and I'm like, oh, all I have to do is say this and the argument is over, right? All I have to do is, you know, say this thing and boom, I've won. But something you've, you've said that has, has stuck with me and uh, is that when there's winners and losers in relationships, inevitably the lo it's the winner who suffers in the long run, right? Right, because the loser will make them pay for it. Mm. Mm. This is an ideal pie in the sky. This is real politics. You, you think you can win and bully your way through to uh, your partner losing because you think of yourself as outside the relationship, but you're in it. You make them feel like shit, and guess what happens to you a week later or two weeks later? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? But, you know, shout out to David Dita for, uh, <laughs> for in his book, um, Way the Superior Man. In that when I see those kill shots, I do the hardest thing, like the most difficult thing I can do in that moment when all I want to do is let wrath out is I go over and I just like wrestle her into a hug. <laughs> and she's like, get off me. <laughs> but usually there's a giggle and a laugh. And of course, if she wants the space and the boundaries, I'll respect that. But inevitably, that works out to be better than taking that kill shot, right? <laughs> Listen. And it was a victory for me. It, felt it like. is a victory for you because what yeah. the fuck is the kill shot for? Mm. It, it, it's just a beater into the ground. Oh, good. Well, I guess you're happy then. You know, this is what I say that got, well, nowadays, uh, 30 years into recovery, both of us, it, it, Belinda and I fight. Uh, one or the other of us will take a break for 15, 20 minutes, and then one or the other will come back. And it sounds something like this. You want to fight? I don't really want to fight. I, I really don't want to fight. You want to fight? <laughs> uh, honey, what do you need? Mm -hmm. Let's get out of this. Well, you could say you're sorry. The public. Oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, Terry, what do you need? Well, you can acknowledge that you, yeah, yeah, okay. All right, we good? We're good? Good, let's make some tea. And the reason why I do that Honest to God is this. This is what I'm thinking. How do I want to spend my evening? That's what I'm thinking. How do I want to spend my evening? Do I want to spend my evening beating this woman into the ground and proving that I'm right? Or can we end the fight in 10 minutes, have a nice meal, and go watch a show on TV? Yeah. And, 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 and likely forget it, why the argument was happening or what it was over or what led up to it. Yeah. It's what I call keeping your eyes on the prize. Mm. You know, in the new rules of marriage, my book on couples, I talk about five losing strategies that the adaptive child will always take some combination. And people listening can 
jot down their particular combination of losing strategies. They are proving that you're right. Good luck with that. Controlling your partner. Good luck with that. Ventilating. Let me tell you just how miserable I am. Retaliating. Let me hurt you the way you hurt me. And withdrawing. I've had enough of this shit. I'm shutting down. Any of those five moves will never get you more of what you want. I talk to people about what I call remembering love. When you're in the heat of the moment with your partner and they're the enemy and it's a win-lose game, uh, you're in a primitive part of yourself. Take a breath. Take a break. Walk around the block. Splash some water on your face. Get yourself re-centered in your wise adult and then come back into the relationship. That break has been a great tool. A great tool. For me, it's um, number one, advocating for the break is, is challenging, but incredibly helpful, right? But you've mentioned in your work before to be very intentional about like, this is, the, this is where I'm going. This is how long I'm going to be gone. And this is when right. I'll be back. Right? There's a That's difference right. between not, not right, just they call responsible distance taking. There's an explanation and there's a promise of return. You don't just leave your partner hanging there. I want to break because I, not you, I, I want to break because I need to collect myself. I'll check in with you in 15 minutes. We'll see where we are. Shout out to a previous relationship where there was abandonment issues involved as well. And I just poof disappeared because my little boy wanted to take his time. It was a very hurtful thing to do and a very valuable lesson i tell you that but with that intentional time for me it's the journal because there are things that when that pen hits the page that i would never ever in my life want anyone i'm close to, mm -hmm. to to hear or to feel or for me to say but once it's on the paper god it feels good just to get it out and then look at it from an objective stance once it's out and go yeah that's mm -hmm. not true but i was so close to just letting that out and using that as a sword, a rusty sword that I could just hack and slash. But instead, once it's out, it creates room for, to be able to see the person in, in that light, right? Have that clarity of intent of what I want to get back to. In yeah, the right. What are you doing this for? Yeah. Somebody said, wait, why am I talking? You get a grip on yourself. What are you about? Uh, 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 do you want, yeah, I talk to people about what I call remembering love. In the heat of that moment, remember that the person you're speaking to is someone you care about. And remember that the reason why you're speaking is to make things better. And if it's anything else, you're not an immature part of you. Take a break and go for a walk. You know, once you're seated and wait a minute, I love this person. I want this to work out. You're halfway there. That's the hard part is getting to the place where you're even open to repair. Absolutely. So one thing I want to uh, talk to you about before, before we finish today is, um, is the male individual in relationship, right? So we've spoken about the importance of intimacy starting with self, right? Into me. Yeah. But how that relates to the relationship, um, let's talk about how the, the arena, let's just say, well, arena is not the right way to talk about relationship, the river. <laughs> the river has changed uh it just in a lifetime mm -hmm. you know my parents what what the traditional relationship looked like mm -hmm. is vastly different than what's being formed today for their parents even more mm -hmm. so very different esther perel um has coined it the grand ambition of love yeah, yeah. can you explain that because i think that'll set it up well esther's meaning in that phrase and we've taught a lot together and i've heard her uh, it is this idea that one person is going to do everything for you. That's the grand ambition of love. That what used to take a village can be found in a twosome. And it, it's a lie. Uh, it's a nice ambition, but it's a lie. The, the, for me, the grand ambition of modern love, as distinct from a couple of generations ago, is that we want real intimacy. We want a truly intimate relationship, not just two partners who can function together. We, we want to go for long walks on the beach and hold hands and have heart-to-heart -heart talks and have great sex in our 70s and beyond. 
But what I say, Brandon, is that what we really want is to be lifelong lovers with each other. But here's the bitter pill, my friend. If you want to be lifelong lovers, you have to act like a lover. And we stop acting like lovers. We stop cherishing our partners and cherishing the relationship. And we start defending ourselves instead of tending to them. And uh, we lose it. There's, well, yeah, right. Taking the warrior mask off, right? That, that men can actually be raised into those roles of doing and providing and protecting. But what if we resubscribe or, or, or just change the way that, that men are viewed is to go, well, masculine means strong and protector and provider, but instead take some of the nurturing pressure off females, right? What's expected of them to just be the nurturer the nurturer and, and yet just more nurture <laughs> well, you know in, in heterosexual right. relationships women across the west are insisting on more emotional openness and connection uh than we raise boys to have and that's where i come in and where you come in to help men get um literate about their Anger. own feelings and their own wants and needs you know god damn it how come, how come the dinner isn't ready? Uh, it could really mean I had a shitty day at work. I could use a hug. Right? Yeah. And, and to be able to hold space for one another. I, I love what you said, right? This, and how it relates to this grand ambition of love is that, you know, I've met my person, right? My lifelong lover. And to expect the world from them is to just set them up for fire. Well, you know, not only do we have these wild expectations, but we have shitty skills. We have, <laughs> we have filet mignon ambitions and we have hamburger skills. But in this, this is not a relationship cherishing culture. It's a patriarchal culture. And uh, we don't teach our sons and daughters relationship skills. I would like basic relationship skills taught in elementary school and junior high and high. Mm -hmm. uh, just like brushing your and flossing your teeth, how to have a good fight, how to make how to make up, how to stand up for yourself and l l cherish your partner in the same breath. Our, our culture doesn't teach people how to do these things, so it doesn't. You have to learn. Yeah, right. It doesn't teach all because of this rugged individualism that that has been the operating model for so long has just figure it out on your own take it into your cave and when you have the answer bring it out yeah and that it doesn't work no. it, it, it it rarely ever like produces any fruit and so one of the best pieces of advice i think i ever heard shared in a men's group was when a, a man was having a trouble in his having trouble in his relationship and one of the, the leaders of the the group said don't go to herd to try and fix this problem seek support from the men in your life Ah, oh, beautiful seek support from the men in your life because it's not her job to save you right now from this or to fix you from this it's not her job yeah well, and that has been my language for that yeah. brandon is uh maturity comes when we tend to our uh, inner children and don't hoist them off on our partners to tend to I like that. Because, yeah, <laughs> they're not babysitters, are they? No. And they love those little boys in us, mm. but they're not responsible for them. What's a great way to communicate that in the moment? If, if someone feels like that they're having to take on a lot and they may not be in the position, right? They may not have their feet on the ground to be able to uh, support that partner, friend. To be able to say, hey, you might need to go to your mates for this or your girlfriends for this. How would you word that? Or what would you recommend people do? I talk to men about um, working on their relationships with other men. Driving them deeper. Uh, the way you drive a relationship deeper, when if it's all about weather and sports, is you start talking more personally yourself. First you ante up and see how your friend reacts and two out of three guys will go right back to baseball but that third guy will say you know i had the same that guy's your friend go out and have coffee with him and i also talk to people about training your friends 
Uh, I don't want to hear that Belinda's a bitch. I already know she's a bitch. I want to hear that Terry's an asshole. Uh, I, I, if you want to support me, don't just encourage me to complain about my partner. Encourage me to turn the radar in and have a, a, a clear-eyed look at what's going on inside of me. Right. No echo chambers allowed. It's a, it's a place where men can lovingly hold your feet to the fire. Yeah, men can being, do that. If you're being a butthead. Yeah, men can do that for each other. <laughs> and, and one of the things before we leave I wanted to talk about was, um, it, which I think is really critical for men, is the difference between gratification and relational joy. Uh, because boys are knocked out of connection and relationships so early. Uh, a lot of men don't know what relational joy is. Uh, so let me start with that. Relational joy is the deep down pleasure, and it's the best pleasure on earth is what we're designed for. Relational joy is the deep down pleasure of just being connected and being there. And sometimes it's great, and sometimes it's a pain in the ass. But you wouldn't want to be anywhere else because this is where you belong. That's relational joy. Um, I always tell the same story. When little Alexander, the guy with the dress, was even younger, uh, like two, uh, I gave him a timeout, and I was holding the door of his room closed. We don't have locks. and He was trying to get it open. And it took all my strength to keep that door. It was two, right? But I mean, like, yeah, the house was shaking. And and even though there was a part of me that wanted to just throw him through the window, uh, there was another part of me that was like, you mighty little spirit, you. You are really something. And I hated him. Uh, but uh, my hatred had nothing to do with my deeper sense of love and joy. That's relational joy. And when men don't have that, when men don't have the joy of being connected, they self-medicate with gratification, with pleasure. Yep, the, the ejaculation to the pornography. That's right. Or the yeah. drink, or the pot, or the flirting, or the workaholism. Numbing in a sense, right? Numbing, giving yourself the boost of short-term pleasure, which has its place. But it, you're a sieve because uh, what you're trying to lift up from is your own poor relationship with yourself and your poor relationship with the people around you. And you will never be happy until you learn to move from gratification to connection and joy. Beautiful. Beautiful, Terry. Well, mate, there, there are so many pearls and gems uh, that have come out of this time with you, mate. I, I sincerely hope it isn't the last time. I mean, you said it yourself. When the when the book comes out. I'll be back. You and me. You and me can have another <laughs> chat. We're tight. <laughs> well, mate, um, one last thing. You know, you've got 40 plus years of experience in men's work. And uh, you really show that beautifully in uh the documentary beyond men and masculinities you know we had uh, director alex gabby on the show previously on episode 13 to talk about it and there's it's a screen. beautiful film beautiful oh, film. He, he did a really beautiful job of of painting a, a a great bird's eye view right and not avoiding any conversation topics which i thought was fantastic and you do some beautiful facilitation for some men going through some experiences in their lives and that there's another screening for this film, right? Masick, Masick, um, coming right. up. It's you and Dr. Judy Chu, who I absolutely adore. She's been on the show as well. She is amazing. Her research is so important to this work. That's coming up. What are you most excited about this? Uh, this about the documentary? Well, the documentary and, and the event on the sick. Oh well, it'll be a great joy to uh, to be with Judy. Um, I've you know when I say boys. Uh, stop being expressive at three. That's Judy too. I'm quoting. Bingo. Uh, she's been at this game for a long time now, and a great contributor. So it'll be great fun to be with her, and and fun to be reunited with Alex. That was a very intense weekend uh, we had with uh, the six men, and uh, uh, no, nobody knew how it was going to go, and 
Um, it was beautiful. It was a very beautiful thing. I, I, I agree. I agree. So, uh, of course, those listeners, um, this episode is going to be coming out on Friday. That's going to be Friday the... Anyway, I'll confirm that. But in the show okay. notes, there's going to be links to the event uh, when this episode is released. And for those of you watching live, we're going to make sure they're in the comments as well. Mate, what brings you the most hope and excitement for this, uh, these next generations coming up and, and the way you see things changing? You do. Young people, and particularly young men, the younger the man, uh, by and large, uh, the more daylight there is between him and the tradition. Baby boomers my age, the men are just, they've had it. And they're getting divorced. They're getting left in record numbers. But you young guys, you have feelings. You can talk. You can be vulnerable. You haven't completely bought the, the, the line. And... Um, I think that millennial men are, uh, by uh, far and large, the most gender progressive generation we've seen. You're, you're for gay rights. You're for uh, the two career families. You know you have to ante up and help out around the house. You can share a feeling or two. You know you were raised by feminist mothers, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, we're moving. You know, I thought we had a knock until 2016 like a lot of people yeah and what's clear to me is that we're at war <laughs> masculinity is at war with itself and specifically the progressive open-hearted new version of masculinity is sparring with the hierarchical i'm in charge authoritarian model and um you young men are on the front lines of this battle. And as I say in, in my new book, uh, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that the fate of the earth depends on which side of this battle wins. Hopefully it doesn't have to be the expense of people's uh, character, right? Their identity. Hopefully we can get into a habit of indicting versus inviting yeah i love that yeah yeah you know uh i don't know who did it but somebody wrote uh, about uh, somebody said i don't call it was a black woman talking about you know race and she said i don't call people out i call them in yeah beautiful that's, words <laughs> that's what i'm talking about absolutely mate absolutely well terry mate let's talk about your work and how people can find out more about you uh so there's terryreal.com uh, what is the one the right t e r r y r e a l.com and the website is chock full of stuff mm. uh, i'm in the middle of a beautiful uh, uh, online course with the, this german mystic and great collective trauma healer thomas ubel i'm going to be offering a course online course for the general public on how to have relationships my first time uh and um uh i'm training therapists all around the world on how to do this well whether you're an individual seeking guidance and help or if you're a therapist looking to get involved in terrorist kind of work definitely check out that website and for me youtube just had an abundance of, um, of resources and stuff that you've done, which was fantastic as well. Terry, mate, an absolute pleasure. Thank you for taking the time, mate. I, I've, I feel so much richer for the time. Having to oh, great. You. I feel very, very, it's been very lovely speaking with you, Brandon. Yeah. Awesome, mate. And for those of you that have been joining us live for another recording of the Mankind Podcast, guys, thank you so much for your comments. Thank you for your giveaway. Thank you for your time and thank you for checking in. You know, there are those that are willing to st uh, just sit on the sidelines, right, and just watch the world go the way it is. But those who are willing to contribute to the conversation, regardless of which side or wherever you stand, you're a part of it. You're in it. You're willing to get your hands muddy and bloody. And that is what is going to change or create change in this world. So thank you to all of you for joining us for another episode of the Mankind Podcast, the show where we break the mold of modern manhood to prove that there is more than just one way to be. 
man. And I think we've done that today, Terry. I think we've done great, Brandon. It's been beautiful. <laughs> and I've loved this sort of cross-generational vibe too. You know? My uh, uh, you know what? Respect to uh respect to age, but my it, this is like just chatting to one of my best mates. Good. Just we're just shooting the breeze, mate. Good. Too natural, too much fun. So. <laughs> Hey, before you run off, I think it's important to let you know that if you enjoyed the time that you just spent listening to Terry Real and would like an opportunity to listen to him speak on broader topics surrounding manhood and masculinity, then you're not going to want to miss this opportunity, which is the last live screening of the film Beyond Men and Masculinity is happening on May 6th. Together, Terry and Judy are going to be answering questions as well as they're going to be screening the film which we spoke about in episode 13 with the director himself, Alex and Gabby. So if you want information to get yourself a ticket for this event, just know they're being swept up fast. And the previous one that was held on April 15th was sold out. So get your hands on some tickets. Links are in the show notes. And if by chance you haven't heard episode 13, then here is the trailer for Beyond Men and Masculinities. Being a boy comes with a certain set of rules. How do you be one of the boys? Crying was very looked down upon. And, and your father was... My father was front and center with that, yes. They have all these feelings, and there's nowhere for these feelings to go. They know it's considered a feminine weakness. Boys work very, very hard to achieve a masculine identity. But that identity can be taken from them. Patriarchy is a deviously clever system. Men learn to escape by moving from shame to grandiosity. We teach them to disconnect from their feelings. We teach them to disconnect from vulnerability. Vulnerability is a missing link that men need to be truly powerful. To be a man means to be in the superior position. So any move toward democracy, which is toward equality, becomes a threat to manhood. And if manhood is threatened, violence is imminent. There's a puzzle that we have to figure out. What's happening right now is an opportunity for men to be human. To be completely trusted and vulnerable and not be judged is what helps me to becoming this new human being. Kindness and caring and loving. And how about those be the alpha traits? We're trying to figure out how to be fully ourselves and fully connected at the same time. It's the only thing that will really make us happy. We're really disrupting some core foundational elements upon which our society is built. And that feels dangerous. This has been the Mankind Podcast produced in association with the Mankind Project USA. I have been your host, Brandon Clift, and I personally want to thank our guests for joining us today and imparting their wisdom from their experiences in this amazing journey called life. And of course, I want to thank you, the listener, because through your attention and your support, you make it a heck of a lot easier for us to let men out there in the world know that they are not alone and that there is more than one way to be a man. Special thanks, of course, goes to my incredible team, Marketing and Communications Director Boyson Hodgson, Producer and Editor of this episode, Michael Russo, who makes me sound so much more intelligent than I actually am, so of course, special kudos goes there. And if you've been enjoying the music throughout this episode and all of our episodes, check out Jim, Donovan, and the Sun King Warriors. I have links to them in the show notes. Now, the fee for this episode is simple. If you found gold and insights that you believe could benefit your loved ones and those you care about, be sure to share it with them. And of course, remember that life doesn't happen to us. It happens for us. So long as we rip the pen out of fate's hand and become the author of our own story. So my friend, pick up the pen and we'll see you next week. Lots of love.